Good evening and welcome uh, to Flinders University and to the uh, BRAVE lecture series. My name is Alison Kitson and I'm the Executive Director of the uh, College of Nursing and Health Sciences and also the Foundation Director of our new uh, Research Institute, Caring Futures. Um, I would like to start by acknowledging the, tra the traditional owners of the land upon which uh, Flinders is based, uh, the Garna people, and uh, pay my respects to elders past, present, and emerging. So what is Brave, the Brave Lecture Series all about? Well, actually, um, you have to be brave to tackle some of the big, uh, complicated problems that our societies face. And the whole idea of the Brave Lecture Series is to do exactly that, challenging the status quo, finding solutions, challenging the old hegemony and the old power bases. And tonight we're going to tackle one of, um, possibly one of the biggest and growing uh, challenges that we face in, in our society. Just think uh, that actually 20% of us, so that's one person in every five people you meet um, has a disability. And yet, why do we think that having a disability is something that you don't talk about, something that you don't celebrate, something that lim limits your life? These are the things that we're going to be talking about tonight, and we have two really excellent experts, uh, dedicated, passionate people who are going to be helping us think about this. We have Sally, Sally Robinson, who is a dear friend and colleague, who's uh, uh, our Chair of uh, Inclusion and uh, Disability at Flinders University, as well as our um, Better Communities Theme Lead in the Caring Futures Institute. And beside Sally, we have uh, Michaela Crotty. And Michaela was just telling me that she's also uh, has been working uh, at the at Flinders University, but now is working um, at uh, um, Orange, Purple Orange, yes, and uh, is the policy and research uh, lead there. So we'll have Sally uh, starting us off with uh, her lecture, her short presentation, really to stimulate us, and then what we really want to be doing though, we know that there are a lot of people very interested in this topic, very passionate about this topic, and possibly people who have lived experiences of the things that we're going to be talking about tonight, which is righting the wrongs, building safer lives for people with disabilities. So we want to hear from you. So we've got live streaming of uh, through Facebook that you can send your questions to. You can um, do Twitter as well, and the hashtag for Twitter is Brave Research. So start those questions coming. We've already got several, and we're going to be starting uh, with those. But uh, before, without any more ado, I'm going to ask and invite Sally to sort of get us into the zone of what the wrongs are that we need to be writing. Sally. Thanks, Alison. Thanks so much for being here with us this afternoon uh, and for uh, taking the time to think through some of these issues. These are, this is difficult and distressing territory. Uh, and so uh, if you need to step away from this, if you need to take care of yourself, please do take the time to do that. Um, uh, for all of us, this is a long and difficult road that we're walking. I'd like to start by thinking about where we are right now uh, in this, uh, this cycle, this long cycle. Uh, most of you who are online right at the moment probably realise that um, we have gone from crisis to crisis. Uh, the people whose faces that you see in front of us um, are what have stimulated the latest round of outrage about the terrible, needless, preventable deaths of people with disability, the shocking waste, the terrible neglect that people have lived with, uh, the, the chronic and entrenched harms that people live with, though, are less visible. 
People with disability though, when you ask them about their experiences can tell you that it's only too common for people to live with daily abuses, with the drip, drip, drip of insult and injury that really blights people's lives. Uh, these are not unusual experiences. We're at a watershed moment though, it feels like, uh, because we've had um, a sustained um, uh, sense of, um, of, of outrage, uh, a cumulative sense of, of um, that, that something really has to change. Um, there's, there's a greater investment than ever uh, in systems, uh, in structures, but we're not seeing evidence of widespread transformative change. So I think there are really interesting questions for us to ask about how we can approach this dreadful problem, this blight on the lives of people who are important parts of the fabric of our communities differently. We don't know how many people with disability experience violence, abuse, neglect and exploitation. And I don't think we ever accurately will because we don't have ways to hear from lots of people about those chronic entrenched harms that people experience. We do know that the deaths of Anne-Marie Smith, David Harris, Willow Dunn, the sorts of awful abuses that led to the Royal Commission are the tip of a very big iceberg. The fact that we don't even measure a lot of these kinds of harm is in itself a measure of how little we care about it as a society though. The statistics that we've got tell us that around 65% of people with disability have experienced at least one violent incident since the age of 15. We know that around 14% of children with disability are estimated to have experienced um, maltreatment, including a range of sorts of harm. And that's around three times the amount of children who don't have disability. In just its first year of operation, the Quality and Safeguards Commission reported more than 1,500 cases of abuse. And that was only across two states of Australia. We know we're dealing with a massive problem. But we can't keep focusing on what emerges above the waterline and ignore what's sitting underneath. The causes of abuse are really complex and they require much more complex and much more well-considered strategies to resolve than what we've delivered to date. Thinking about where we've been, historically, there have been few, if any, protections for people with disability who've experienced a wide range of violence, abuse, neglect in their lives. People, as we've just talked about, have experienced very high rates of harm, but they've experienced um, the sorts of responses where uh, their harm has been conceptualised and downplayed, ignored, minimised, treated as incidents of, um, of bad practice, of poor service standards, um, of administrative infringements or workplace issues that need to be addressed rather than viewed as violence or crimes against them. And this widespread tendency to downplay or to minimise abuse and neglect uh, as, um, uh, as service incidents denies people legal protections uh, and justice that's extended to other people. There's a fundamental disparity in the responses to people with disability uh, and um, to, to other people in the community. That shows up uh, in uh, multiple inquiries. It shows up in research, our research and other people's research. And it shows up in the lived experience of people with disability who give testimony to those, evident, those inquiries again and again. More recently, we've seen prevention approaches that um, essentially the, the, what the picture shows there, put an ambulance at the bottom of the cliff and a fence around the top of the cliff to try and stop people uh, from experiencing so much abuse. Those are things like compliance measures with standards and auditing uh, that, that um, aim to put more safeguards in services. Other safeguards measures like checks for workers, community visiting, complaints mechanisms, and the emergence of some models that guide practice, like public health, the, the public health tertiary approach to violence uh, that we see particularly in domestic violence and child protection. 
Um, and in the uh, NDIS quality and safeguards approach, the way that they've interpreted that is in, as developmental, preventative and corrective safeguards. Underpinning all of these approaches though um, is perhaps a, a lack of focus on the big picture. Uh, where we're still thinking about people with disability as um, uh, people who are part of the welfare system, people who are subject to a need of care and protection, rather than people who are citizens entitled to rights. We definitely see an absence of people with disability as leaders, um, people who underpin uh, our research policy and practice that alters the culture and practice of services that are provided to them. Um, and there are very real risks that compliance and risk management approaches um, uh, educate workers about the ethical components of their work uh, and their role in standing alongside people uh, as they resolve harms that have occurred to them. These traditional approaches to safety and abuse prevention also think about um, uh, abuse prevention and abuse response as interconnected, but they think quite separately uh, about activities to build a good life. And it's really hard for people with disability, especially people with cognitive disability, to put some of their personal safety strategies into place, not due to capacity of those people, but due to the circumstance. The sort of relational dynamics that uh, are involved in keeping safe, the sort of social and structural, political, interpersonal issues and barriers that interact with people's strategies really militate against the successful use of tools that might, in more successful environments, work more effectively with them, for them. And people with disability can't do that by themselves. Other people need to be involved, especially for people with high support needs. Uh, in creating safe spaces and cultures and environments uh, and service structures where people's voice is heard and responded to and respected. So newer perspectives in building uh, safer lives recognise that building a good life, a flourishing life, is in fact customised abuse prevention. They're really underpinned um, with a human rights lens. Um, they recognise the significance of activating human rights in people's lives. And the human rights approach doesn't provide any special rights, but it looks at people with disabilities having the same rights as other citizens and the same opportunity to enact those rights. And that's critically important here because of the way that violence and abuse has been normalised over time for people with disability, especially people who are heavily um, reliant on services. What a human rights approach does is promote inclusion and removal of segregation and people's citizenship across all of the areas of our community. Um, looking at the way that, um, the whole, that people's whole experience of inequality uh, and the universal and the interrelated uh, nature of rights, rather than looking at one person's experience of um, one uh, um, uh, experience of abuse in one sector. To achieve that, we really need to think about our public discourse. Uh, we need to think about moving away from care and protection to thinking about the way that our public institutions function and how they're answerable to people who experience high degrees of inequality and disenfranchisement. Uh, and the role of those key institutions, justice, education, employment, housing, health, um, and those support systems so that people with disability can be an equal part of those. Now that's transformative and it requires leadership, it requires evidence, it requires policy change and all of those things need to be informed by the lived experience of people with disability. To do that, we need to get past the fence. That fence that was at the top of the cliff, we've got to move back past that fence. Transformative abuse prevention measures sit beyond what we've currently got in existing prevention and safeguarding frameworks. People with disability and advocates have been emphasising this for a long time uh, and they feature in research as well. Um, so th there's a need to raise our expectations around choice and decision making and relationships for people with disability. Uh, and um, for people to be safe in the services that they use, their priorities and their perspectives have to carry weight. In no other community is it acceptable for people to spend time with the people who they fear or from whom they experience violence, abuse and neglect.
in the same way that it is for people with disability. So what might be transformative? When you look at this list of things, think about them in the context of your own life, your own relationships. They're quite fundamental. Things like relationships, having a mutual sense of care, respect and value for each other. Meaningful connections, a sense of purpose and a sense of belonging in your life and support that's tailored to those kinds of aspirations where you have help to build those things if you need it, ways to make it clear if something's not right, and ways to recover from the effects of harm if you experience harm. The fact that this would be a radical transformation in the lives of so many people with disability is a dreadful thing. This is the purpose and the aim of the NDIS. And how so much has got in between people and their hopes and their dreams and their aspirations for a good life, for a flourishing life, is something that we really need to question. We can't answer it in a short presentation like this, but it's a question that we need to be asking ourselves collectively. Why have we got such technocratic solutions? Why have we got so many layers and layers of bureaucracy? Why, have we, why are we cutting costs? And where are we cutting costs? And why have we got a failure in transformative thinking that is standing between people and their good life? I think we've got this urgency, this sense that we need to solve these problems. We've got to get rid of them. We've got to fix them now. What can we do? This is urgent. And it is urgent. It's a terrible problem. People shouldn't be living with this kind of things in their life for one more day. There are things we can do immediately to make people safer. We can listen and respond to people's own priorities. In research we've done with people about building personal safety and preventing abuse, people know. They have good strategies. They have ideas about what to do to improve their lives. Young people with disability talk about how to build physical safety, relational safety, how to build a sense of access that they feel welcome, they feel wanted, they feel missed when they're not there. Uh, how to build authority. Uh, in their own lives. Um, we can think about how to support decision making and control from the very small things, the very small choices, building up and up and up uh, into uh, the, um, the big life choices for people with disability. We can resource connection building. We can build skill. We can harness the community concern, the level of community concern that we have now about these terrible deaths that have happened to Anne-Marie Smith, David Harris and Willow Dunn, the other sorts of harms that have, people have been increasingly concerned about. We can break down the binaries between specialist and mainstream and, and find ways to welcome people into relationships. And we can open some difficult conversations. There's been a really long-standing silence about the kinds of, uh, the, the fact that not every family is a safe family. Lots of families are, but there's an awful silence about the fact that not every family is a safe family for people with disability, for example. Longer term, I think uh, we need to focus on the iceberg, not the tip of the iceberg. And by talking about the things that we can do urgently, by putting in more compliance measures, by putting in more uh, things to respond quickly, we, we take our focus away from the iceberg and we keep our focus on the tip, the things that poke out the top. Working on the intersections um, uh, is really important. And recognising the nexus between the, the nature of service systems and the, the sort of ableism that's in society is really important. Uh, the way that we see disability as something that's inherently vulnerable rather than, uh, as, than as a citizenship question. I think we've got to really recognise that disability is a fundamental part of human nature. It's part of our families, it's part of our communities. And we need a mindset change. And it's only that mindset change that's going to get us the leadership that we need and result in the policy change that we need for transformation. Otherwise, we're going to continue to tinker around the edges without realising the fundamental nature of systems is something that, that uh, is really part of our, our, our problem. And lastly, um, but absolutely not least, we need investment. We need to invest in people, 
in communities, in potential, and then in systems, purposefully in systems. This is my friend and colleague, Jamesy. Um, she had a really rich and flourishing life. Um, we worked together for three years every week on um, a piece of research about what is good, what, what builds quality and relationships with uh, young people with disability and their support workers. Um, Jamesy died a year ago and she left a huge personal void but a massive loss in our field. And this week on Twitter, I saw it again when I was posting about a survey paper that we'd put up. There was an acknowledgement for Jamesy in the paper. And I was really reflecting about why was her contribution so important? Why were people commenting on the acknowledgement to Jamesy? Nobody cared about our survey paper, uh, which was fine, but people were commenting about Jamesy. And it was about the lack of investment. People with intellectual disability are a vanishingly small proportion of people in leadership positions. There are so many other ways that people contribute through advocacy, policy, practice, the ways that people show their preferences and their priorities in everyday life. Every time that we look away from an opportunity to invest in this mutual benefit that we have through relationship with people, we open up a space where abuse can get in when we refuse a little boy's application to join the scout group, when we don't make eye contact at the cafe with somebody, when we don't invest in making school inclusive and meaningful and beneficial for everybody, when we don't make space. This isn't a disability problem, it's a social problem. It's an issue for all of us. That's where I want to finish for now um, uh, and I open up the conversation Thank you. I'd like to just leave some numbers up on the screen though. Um, I don't know if you can see them. Um, thank you. Okay, so thank you, Sally. Um, before I go into the questions, and we have several coming in, um, I, I just, you know, what struck me when you were speaking was uh, it's almost a, a question of unconscious bias. You know, there is, there is such a deep sense of we can't, we talk about the problem, but we really don't want to engage it in it because it is too hard and it, 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 it sort of changes our own ways of thinking and our own ways of thinking about ourselves as human beings. And there's been an indoctrination that, you know, to be human is, is one thing and to be uh, someone with a flourishing life uh, living uh, positively with a disability is is not the way you want to be and that is such a fallacy it's such a fantasy you know and, and we it's I just as a nurse and as someone who you know is very um, intimately involved in what's happening with the Royal Commission everything that you've just said you could replace disability with aged care and we have the same things happening so you know really really uh, quite disturbing and does need brave, bold and brilliant people to respond to it. So Michaela, tell us a bit more about Purple Orange. Thanks Alison. Well, a huge amount of the work that we do at Purple Orange is around systemic advocacy, but also is focused on helping people living with disability move into greater social connections. So um, as an agency, we have been advocating for adequate safeguarding of vulnerable people for years. And we would see that a real way of doing this is that promoting inclusion, promoting greater community connection, building people's capacity for having more relationships, more community contact, um, more opportunities in their life. This is where we see the natural safeguards occurring. And, and it's interesting because one of the questions that came in from Catherine was this notion that, that uh, people with a disability are, are sort of categorised as either mm -hmm. dehumanised or superhumanised mm -hmm. rather than being just seen as normal people. So how, how do you overcome that? Well, I think, again, then that would come straight back to promoting social inclusion. Um, so, for example... At Purple Orange, one of the things we have advocated for for many years is that the best tool we have to adequately safeguard people living with disability is 
natural safeguards. And by that, what we mean is opening up chances in their lives for natural safeguards to emerge. So community connection, being a family member, being a neighbour, um, acquaintances, friends, co-workers. So having ordinary life chances that bring people and those natural safeguards into your life. And, and why do you think, uh, given that it is almost so self-evident that policymakers, uh, health professionals, people in social uh, areas, social care in councils, don't really get it? You know, what do, we, what do we have to do to make more people get it? I think that comes back to awareness. So I think that one of the things might be that people are very focused on reducing risk and simply reducing bad things occurring in the lives of somebody who lives with disability. Um, and that is one side of the story. But I think there's this other side of the story where we actually need to increase um, or do everything we can to promote the chances of good things occurring. And that's a bit that I was really struck by your comment, uh, Sally, building a good life is customised abuse prevention. So you, you have a, a, you know, you've got uh, two for the price of one. You actually enrich, uh, enrich communities, enrich families and enrich individuals and you reduce abuse. So, uh, you know, and I think it, it was uh, Ben um, has, has asked a question which I think might go to the sort of centre of this notion of, of how we safeguard and protect and enable um, flourishing. And Ben asks, why is it that you need a license to be a tradesperson or a paramedic or a nurse and yet with an ABN and a snazzy Facebook, you can become a support worker? Uh, <clears throat> I think um, Ben's comment's a very interesting one. Um, one of the things that's important for us to do is to think about the huge diversity of people with disability, that um, there, there is not um, a, a homogenous group of people who all need support um, uh, in the same kind of way. So um, there are people with disability who um, are incredibly um, well skilled in um, managing their own lives, their own resources, um, who prefer to employ people, uh, they, they look for people who are completely outside of anything to do with the disability services system. Yeah. Um, but there are people who um, uh, um, at, at the other end of the spectrum um, need support for every element of their lives. Um, and it's very important, I think, that those people are supported by workers who themselves are well supported by organisations. Yeah. Um, uh, Anne-Marie Smith's death really shows us that. It's the, the, um, the, the hollowing out of the, the, the system uh, that we've seen, in a sense, through NDIS has really stripped out a lot of training for workers. Uh, and so we've seen things happen that, that are really exemplified by Anne-Marie's death, uh, where training in particular um, in some of the things like what it means to facilitate uh, connections and relationships for people with disability, the ethical components of, yeah. of, of support work have really um, uh, been diminished. Yeah, and, and that may again speak to the unconscious, unconscious bias towards care you know, in, across the whole of our society. But uh, Judith, uh, we've got a question from Judith Leeson, one of our uh, Caring Future ambassadors. So hello, Judith. It's lovely to um, hear you're back on, on um, Facebook. And, and she, uh, again, Judith uh, has picked up this question about, is every decision we make an ethical decision? Not, and I suppose I'd like to frame it in the context that if you, You've talked about relationships and the need for trust within that relationship. You've talked about the fact that um, you know training budgets are cut. You can become a support worker without any sort of clearance, and yet that is at the heart of of a, a reciprocal relationship that can either be very fulfilling or can be very damaging. So how are we going to create? Um, the right sort of ethical frameworks around these these situations so that families, people with disability and support workers can all, you know, be enriched by the experience? Uh, uh, I, 
I think that's an entire other webinar. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think um, there, there are several levels of things that are happening. Um, one is what's happening in between people and, their, and the, the people who are working to support them. Um, I think there's a whole other layer of things that are happening between people and their organisations and workers and their organisations. Um, we just did some research last year about building safe and respectful cultures in disability services. Some of the things that came out of that that were really interesting were um, about how hard it was for everybody to stand in each other's shoes, um, how stressed everybody was and what happened to sort of abrade the relationships between people then. Um, uh, and some other research that we've just finished about the quality of relationships showed that uh, in that sort of interpersonal relationship, when people feel cared about, valued and respected together in their relationships, they, they're really good foundations for building trust and reciprocity in relationships, but at the organisational level, there are things that need to happen between um, what people with disability in organisations uh, and, and their families for people who need support with decision making, um, and between workers and organisations, so that there um, there's there's a, a, a network or a web of things mm -hmm. that need to be going on. And Michaela, you were just saying about. Uh uh, your organisation, you have a thing called uh, um, Co-Design Council and uh, tell us a bit about that and how that can address in really practical ways the things sure. that Sally's talking about. So we have recently established a Co-Design Council which um, involves around 10 members of um, people living with disability and they represent a large variety of lived experiences um, around disability. and. The reason that this co-design council is so powerful is because of the way that an issue can be looked at and considered across these levels of lived experience. Um, and so it's wonderful to have a group of people who are leaders in the disability community being able to look at and make recommendations, consider policies, etc around issues that are really, really important for people living with disability. And um, obviously through um, the work that we're doing at our, uh, in the Caring Futures Institute, we want to learn from uh, people like Sally and Michaela and Judith uh, uh, to see how we can authentically um, embrace the voice of the person who's experiencing, you know, the, the, uh, the what it happens to get old and start to be dismissed uh, what it's like to live with a disability. So these are all really important things that we want to continue the conversation around. Um, we've got one last time for um, a, a, what is probably uh, the, one of the big questions, the big opportunities and the big questions. And we've got uh, Annie who's, who's um, is sort of, uh, can sort of introduce us to this and quite rightly Annie says you know there's so many inquiries uh, there's so many discussion papers there's so much evidence there's so much talk and and people with a disability are all expected to to sort of you know get in have a view talk about it but yet you know people with a disability are already the people who are the victims so how, how can we hear people's voices um, but not make them do all the work so I think that was more a comment and again a um, working uh, with the Royal Commission in Aged Care um, there has been a huge amount of work and we just want to make sure it all counts so this is really the the um, the hundred million dollar question so we have several Royal Commissions happening at the minute. We've got the Royal Commission into Disability. So I want to ask you both a question um, and I'll ask Michaela first. So Michaela, Royal Commission, what's your best hope and what's your worst fear? Mm. So I'd have to say that my best hope for this Royal Commission is that it raises the general community's awareness of the issues that people living with disability have faced for many, many years now in a very ugly and vicious cycle. Um, so my hope is that through a Royal Commission, which is one of the highest levels of inquiry that we could ever possibly have, that your average community-minded person suddenly has a lot more insight into what people living with disability have been subjected to. 
Um, I'd have to say that my worst fear is that that doesn't happen. Um, and if that doesn't happen, then my fear is that we will continue to see segregation of people living with disability in our community. And then the flow on effect from that is simply that we see people segregated, we don't see them going into real jobs, we don't see them having the usual ordinary valued life activities that we would hope for them. And then we don't see them having people in their life who can support them. And what we might see is that space that Sally mentioned mm. before, where that space for abuse opens up. Thank you. Sally? Um, my best hopes and worst fears are quite aligned to Michaela's. Um, my best hope is that the Royal Commission will see the connection between what it means to live um, a good, connected, flourishing life and preventing abuse uh, and take the opportunities that so many uh, incredibly skilled and insightful people are putting in front of it uh, to make, to recommend transformative change um, that, that, that really um, uh, disrupts some of the unintended consequences of systems that we've got now. Um, my biggest fear is that we tinker with the systems that we've got, that we add some more compliance measures to what we've currently got and that we don't do anything that really disrupts what's happening now and that then in another 10 years we've got another series of inquiries into the same problems that we've had, we already have. So, so really uh, it's, a, a mind, uh, it's a mindset shift and, and it is about um, uh, acknowledging that uh, every human life is, is important and has equal value and every uh, right of every human being is that uh, they should be enabled to have a good flourishing life uh, from birth to death. And let's face it, we've all got our disabilities. Some disabilities are just a bit more obvious than others. So it is that notion that we, we are all vulnerable, we're all human, we all need to care for each other, and we all need uh, to have those relationships around us and that engagement in community. Um, look, it's been incredibly, um, uh, stimulating and thought-provoking um, sort of session in line with the uh, the mission of the Brave Lecture. I think it is we've just started the conversation and I know that there have been a lot of people interested in this. Uh, if we haven't been able to answer your questions, uh, Sally's going to go and do a bit of blogging and a bit of tweeting, all these fancy things that I don't know how to do. Uh, but also, if, if anybody is, is wanting to have further conversations with Sally, with Michaela, um, you know, please contact us through the, um, the uh, Caring Futures Institute website. We would love to hear more from you. Uh, we're on a mission to make sure that the Royal Commissions, both in disability and aged care, uh, will uh, lead that sea change, will lead that uh, paradigm shift uh, to bring us into the brave new world. So Sally, thank you so much. Michaela, thank you. And to our wonderful uh, uh, person in the background, Heather, thank you so much and uh, good night.